trust your instincts, trust, trust your gut, whatever you're thinking is the right decision is the right decision. And, and that's something I learned not too far off from being 15 years old. But I, I feel like I made so many decisions in that time based on what my friends wanted me to do, what my parents were telling me to do. Yet, when I started making choices that I thought felt right, and even like people, people, if you get a vibe of, I don't know how I feel about that person, trust it. Like mm. it's, it's more than likely that that feeling is right. Sick. I love the background. Thanks, man. <laughs> what, uh, what was the word that you wanted to talk about? I was going to go, well, I, I saw that somebody else already went authenticity. So I'm going to go uh, with catalyst. Catalyst. Interesting. Yeah. I do allow like repeat words because I'm like, it's inevitably going to happen where someone comes up with the same thing. And I wouldn't want to deprive someone of like, you know, like if you're equally enthused about the word authenticity, we can go with that. But I like catalyst. Catalyst Let's is go good. With catalyst. One. And then we can we can even talk about this as well. So, nice. All right. Yeah, cool. But- yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I just like hit record, so I'll just like cut into our conversation wherever it kind of makes sense. That way it yeah. sort of feels like the person listening or watching is just kind of joining in on the conversation, you know, yeah. just hanging out. But uh, like, what does the word catalyst uh, like mean to you? Like, why did that in particular stick out? Um, It's kind of one of those weird words where like it comes into your life and for whatever reason, it like catches your brain. And originally uh newfound glory had a song and album that was called catalyst and of course like i right away had to look up what it meant and it's uh it's essentially like the start of something or what Mm. kicks something off yeah and not not too long after that album came out i read a book called what they don't teach you in film school and one of their first chapters the the saying that they throw out there is desire is the catalyst to action and at, that's one that's always stuck with me and uh just in thinking of this conversation coming i was thinking of my career comedy film all that stuff and every like there's so many little things that were catalyst to whatever the next part of it was yeah like as a kid uh my parents put me into like all sorts of acting courses and we had agents and stuff when we were kids wow and I uh not much ever came of it but then one day we got a call saying there's a film called the Santa Claus which was filming and they needed kids that were my age basically this is the Tim Allen one the Tim Allen one yeah no way yeah man so that was my that was really my first and only time on set as a kid with all this, you know, this acting training. And uh, I distinctly remember like seeing the lights, seeing all the PAs, seeing the big camera and thinking like, oh, adults make movies as a job. And it had just never dawned on me that yeah. it was like careers. I just thought it was like something that happened, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. And so that in a lot of ways put the bug in my ear slash was the catalyst for me eventually going towards film work. Um, and, you know, I, I went to film school when I was in my early twenties and the first kind of film related job that I got out of that was working on cruise ships. Interesting. And yeah. Without my time working on cruise ships, like I, so at one point I was a videographer, so we just filmed what was going on in the ship and then sold the DVD back to the passengers. That's fantastic. And, I didn't even, see. I love hearing stories like this. Cause I'm like, I didn't even think that was a thing. You know, you're being well, blown away by what's on set and you're like, Whoa, people do this for a job. And you just unlock that in my head. Cause I also totally. looked into the cruise ship thing too, but I was looking like retail, like whatever, you know what I mean? Like whatever yeah. experience I had at that time, but yeah, totally. sorry, go on. And, uh, um, while, while I was on ships, the there was kind of like a side job that you could do, which was called crew club president. And they were, you know, the job was basically organize the different events for the crew members. Like if they're going to go on excursions when we're in port, but the big ones were like the parties or what they called discos and then trivia nights and stuff like that. 
and I ran a ton of trivia nights and uh, band night and all this stuff. And I had been like obsessed with George Carlin and Richard Pryor and these guys and wanted to do comedy, but it wasn't until I did that job and had a bit of experience on the mic where I was like, all right, I feel comfortable up here. I could definitely try it. Mm -hmm. And that led to me going to the uh, Yuck Yucks open mic, trying to get on there, and then eventually talking the people into that gave me my first show. And, and you know, again, it was working on cruise ships and doing that crew club president job were the catalyst to me trying to get into comedy mm -hmm. and eventually doing it. So Now, were you always like uh, the type of kid that was, you know, it – if they needed someone to do something, you're like, I got it. Like it's on me. Like if somebody hand out the the pizza for pizza day, you're like, I'm on it. You know what I mean? Like, was that always kind of in you? Or was that something that was taught to you by your parents to try to go for these opportunities? Or is it more so just like a, you have that desire to, you know, join this crew club president thing and start forming these events? Because I feel like most people will be like, I don't want to do extra work, you know? Yeah, I think it was the the social side of it. Like the thing about working on ships is you're, I mean, it's a seven day a week job and you're around people all the time. Like you your whole department kind of all live in the same, uh, like corridor, all your rooms are with each other. You're rooming with another person in your department. Uh, you become like really fast friends with people and people are coming and going so often. There's a few people that I felt like they were my best friend for like a week and then they'd move, they'd go on to, you know, go home. And mm. some of them I never spoke to again. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, I have some really good, uh, like lifelong friends from ships, like Kareem Hasneen and I, we met on our first contract. We ended up, he was one of the big reasons why I started doing open mics here in Toronto. I mean, he knew where all the mics were and knew mm. a ton of people that were doing it. And, uh, and even like, so Aaron Rye is another guy who was a cruise ship guy that no Kareem, way. Yeah. It, so Kareem and I met on our first ship and came, became best friends on that one. Aaron and Kareem met maybe on Kareem's second or third ship. Mm -hmm. And I moved to Toronto like 11 years ago this month, actually, or last month, I guess, actually. And Aaron moved around the same time and Kareem was the one who was like, let's all go to an open mic together. And we were like the three musketeers of open mics for the longest time. Wow. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, even not having known Aaron from ships, all of our stories are the same. Like everybody's cruise ship stories are almost the exact same. <laughs> like all the shenan shenanigans you get into and the ports you go to and everything like that. So, yeah. and you know, all the same people. So do you ever hook up with a, a passenger? <laughs> No, uh, that's, I don't really have regrets, but that's one of the ones that I have from ships is that was, that was like one of the big rules was no, was like no intermingling no with the, the passengers. passengers. Because the that's thing so is, if, it's the, it's a legal thing for the company. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I, I break the odd rule every now and then. <laughs> yeah. I, I was too much of a wuss back then. I was so, because that, that was it. If you got fired, you had to pay your own way home. Fuck yeah, yeah. And, like, and I, I could never afford that, especially in certain places that we were in. Um, I think on my last ship, I probably should have done it. Just <laughs> yeah, knowing, yeah. One knowing, last, knowing it was my last contract, just been like, fuck it. What are they gonna do? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but oh, also, shit. you're on board with, you know, people from every other culture, every other country. So it's not like they're, you know there wasn't anybody to hook up with. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many yeah. people on those boats. There's so and many it, people on those I guess it depends on like what the cruise ship is, right? Like if you're working Disney Cruise Line, you're like, this is probably not going to happen. I'm probably not going to, you know. No, I'm, pull I'm sure. Mother. Yeah. I'm sure if I was on Carnival, which is like known as the party company. Yeah, yeah. I probably would have Your manager would have been doing crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, well, right, I'll, tell you that, I'll tell you this one story. One guy that I knew he didn't care about that rule at all like that. that's amazing <laughs> and and so one night he comes into there's like a crew bar and i'm like i said i'm seeing a girl from like the the spa at this point and he comes in and he's like he's one of the 
um, like activities dudes, like one of the crew staff people. So he comes in in his full 70s gear because it was disco night with the passengers. Nice. He's got this disgusting shirt on and this wig. And he comes in, he's like, I need your shirt and your hat. And I'm like, come on, dude. No, he's like, no, I need it right now. And I'm like, fuck. And the girl that I'm with is going, what's going on? What's happening? <laughs> I just, just don't worry about it. I go, fine. And so I gave him my shirt and my hat. And he he just wore the hat and walked through the hallways like this and went into her cabin because if they saw like his name tag or any yeah, of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So oh, I was I was an accomplice to one of those crimes. Yeah, you know? My clothing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, shit. But I love um man, there's so many things to pull apart on what you just said about uh like you know, parents trying to get you into the acting world as a kid, and then you're kind of enamored by the the lights and the cameras and everything that's happened, which draws you to go to school for that, and then you end up going on this cruise ship to do stuff, and then comedy happens. As a result of that, do you do you feel like you always would have found your way to comedy no matter what the circumstance was? Like, was that always a thing or was it a series of these catalysts that made you go? Yeah, I could do this because I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Like for me, I always wanted to be a comedian. I knew I always wanted to be a comedian, but the the path did not seem clear of how to achieve that. So it took like several things happening in my life uh for all to kind of line up for me to go okay now's the time to do it you know and and i could yeah. see like somewhat of a, like oh there's an open mic it's uh you know there was a competition that i entered for like funniest person on campus i didn't know anyone there because i was always like oh what are people gonna say if i try this thing right uh it was like all these catalysts like to use the word again that had to be there and go off for me to recognize like what i had to do totally I'd say it's a combination. I, like I said, I was a huge Carlin and Pryor fan in high school. Uh, Saturday Night Live, especially like Farley and Mike Myers and all those guys were huge in my life. You know, every Monday you're back at school repeating all the the bits that you had yeah. just seen on Saturday Night Live. Um, there was a Robin Williams special from the 80s that I can remember my friend and I watching from around the corner while his parents were watching. Oh, whoa. Because we weren't supposed to watch it because there was yeah. bad words and everything. But it <laughs> that always stuck with me, especially because of the, the end of it, Robin has this whole thing where he speaks to himself. There's like two Robins and he's having a conversation with himself. And I don't think I understood what, what that was about as a kid, mm-hmm. but it seemed significant when I was watching it. And I knew I knew that I wanted something to do with comedy in the sense of, you know, I, it's funny. I watched uh, in kind of researching this, this show, I watched uh, yours and Nick Dury's uh, conversation. And you said the thing about wanting to be a wrestler. I mean, clearly I was sort of the yeah, same yeah. way, man. <laughs> we can go uh, into I, that. And I thought, I thought at one point that I would want to, go to school for communications so I could be like an announcer. I could mm. do, I could, I could potentially be a wrestler, but also be a, a wrestling announcer. And, you know, I would have probably gone more to the side of, you know, the Jerry Lawler or the Bobby. I'm Brady. thinking about doing that now. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 that's a dream. That's literally a dream job. Dude, right I don't, now. I don't want to like start too many podcasts here, but like if, if you and I were just like, we had a wrestling like podcast I'd where we'll so just like go, I'd be so stoked. So down for that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that, that, but yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, I, I, so I, there was that side of it where it was, you know, kind of be the, you know, not be the color commentator, not the guy like following the ball, but like making the like observations and the jokes and all that kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I I mean, and especially once I realized that film was the way I wanted to go, it really was like, I'm, I'm still a huge jackass fan and, and, you know, seeing Bam Margera make his own movie Haggard Mm -hmm. and then also Kevin Smith's Clerks like those two movies going like, oh, you can make a movie with your friends and people will see it. That was what kind of pushed me towards film school officially. I mean, the the 
Santa Claus stuff happened and put the bug in my ear. But if I hadn't have seen Jackass or Haggard and especially like Clerk Small Rats, those movies. And I, I mean that there was never a time when I was thinking that that I would want to make like Lord of the Rings or something like that. It was always hmm. just let's let's make funny movies about our friends. So definitely comedy in the grand scheme of things was in the plan. But stand up, like I said, I, I I really got into Carlin when I was like in grade 10, I think it was. And that led me into like watching all Richard Pryor specials. And so I I knew I wanted to do it. I I even found a list not too long ago of like, you know, before the term bucket list, it was like like things you want to try. And it Did was you know that that wasn't even the name until the movie Bucket List. It's crazy. I, I I I remember that movie coming out and the explanation and being like, oh, that's a good like, that's yeah, a good term. But I, you're right. Same thing. I f- fully forgot that that's. Because I thought it was around for so like common. hundreds of years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it might it's as well like, have been I, like a. I watched the thing term. recently. I watched a thing recently where the other one that like kind of surprising was nobody ever used the word toast as like, I'm going to beat them or they're going to kill them till Ghostbusters. Whoa. Until Bill Murray, Bill Murray said that chick is toast. Power of language, man. Like I know, right. can convince minds that it's just been a saying forever, like lit and fam and all these new like Gen Z slangs. It's just part of the lexicon now. Like lol. People, people audibly say lol lol they'll just say it and i'm like what yeah. like oh, i guess all right <laughs> you or could just laugh I don't, <laughs> I don't hear it as much but i remember the first time somebody said brb like in front of my face and i, I was say like, that a lot <laughs> and uh, i'm not against it because it is it is part of the language now yeah. but like the first time you heard it you're like what do you why are you saying it like that yeah why are you speaking to me you in know? code <laughs> yeah exactly we're not but sorry we're not, yeah to go back you said you found a bucket list Yes, I found like a list and do stand up was one of the things on the list. And wow. I had forgotten that I'd ever written that down. But and that would have been before cruise ships. That would have been like maybe while I was in film school. Mm. So it, it was it was in my mind, but I didn't know that it was something that I wanted to do really. And it's kind of funny because last year I I was working in Hamilton. We were rigging a show in Hamilton. And it was a Wednesday. So that's Levity's amateur night. And I've been trying to get on for a while. And Patrick, who who runs that show, is notoriously not great at getting back to people's emails, which most comedy producers are. Like, I'm, I'm yeah. guilty of it, too. Man, I produced one show and the influx of emails that I got, I was like, I don't know how anyone sorts through this. Like, it is ungodly the amount of it's requests terrible. <laughs> it's terrible but I, I i was like all right we're gonna get done and i'm just gonna drive from here to levity and show mm-hmm. up and if i get on i get on but worst case i just get in front of patrick's face mm-hmm. and i went in and another comic from toronto was walking in the door at the same time i was and there was a part of me that was like shit he's gonna get the spot and i'm not like just that that thing inside you that goes oh man this it's not going to work the way I hoped, but whatever, let's go through with it. So we're sitting, we're talking and Pat comes over to us and he's like, uh, so you guys want spots tonight? And this other comic goes, well, I got to get to a show in Mississauga, but yeah, I do want to get on. And so I just look at Pat, I go, I have nowhere else to be. <laughs> and he goes, okay. And he walked away for a second. And what I think he was doing was talking to the host, Dan Brennan, who knew me. And so Pat comes back and Goes to the other guy. He's like, you got to get to another show. And the guy's like, ah, ah. And he goes, you can stay around. I'm like, yeah. He goes, how long can you do? I was like, as long as you need me to. And he goes, all right, if you can do 15 minutes, you're headlining. And so I headlined. <laughs> and it was like, wild, a couple weeks later. <laughs> it was wild, man. It was so wild. And a couple weeks later, I'm walking home and I'm just thinking of that. And I recorded it too. And the recording looked good it sounded good there was enough people in the room that it's like this this actually looks like a real show or sounds like it like a real audience and i just had this moment of you know 11 year old you would be floored that that even happened and i'm walking home and i'm like i'm like just fight back the tears enough so you can get home to cry because I, it was really yeah, a yeah, of yeah. like 
a younger version of me would be so excited at the idea that one day you're going to get on stage and headline yeah. at a comedy club. Yeah. Everything else is just the cherry on top at that point. Like just totally. the doing the stand up is just like, I think about that all the time too, to totally. always like put my current situation in perspective because we get caught up in the day to day bullshit and, and like, you know, people, people try to be, and I, and I'm, say this all the time that I try to be the most supportive of people. And that is truly my support towards other comedians, creators, actors, whatever is just to dampen my own jealousy or envy that I don't even like comprehend because it's not like I, you know, like let's say somebody, uh, Oh, they're, they got a pilot picked up and I'm like, Oh, what that guy got. And then I go, but you didn't write a pilot. You didn't apply yeah. for it. So why would you be, unless you were in competition with them for that thing, maybe there's a reason. for. So it's always like, well, why am I being jealous in this situation here? But like that putting in perspective of like, what would your 11 year old self think of like what you're doing now? It's like, yeah, their mind would be blown. They'd be like, I can't believe you stood up in front of all those people. Were you scared? You know what I mean? Like yeah, totally. kids, kids asking those types of questions. Yeah. Well, and and to what you're saying about other comics doing stuff, I don't know if I ever, I mean, I'm sure there are people that get stuff and I go like, how did that guy get that? And I think, I think that's just in general, comics have this feeling of how did somebody, how did that person get that? Who, who gave it to them? Mm -hmm. I've always tried to have the mind frame of, well, they did it. Why can't I? Yes, that's such a healthier mindset. <laughs> it, it, and and I, again, I'm sure that there's part of me that has the same part as you that that's like, what? How do they like? Yeah, what? there's a, there's an initial like knee jerk reaction to somebody so, succeeding when you feel like you're not succeeding. And yeah. again, success is relevant, right? Like somebody might be looking at your situation and be like, oh, that's success. Like they're yeah. killing it. And then you in that situation are like, yeah, but I don't have this. Like I was just talking to Black Zeus and he was like, I posted the clip of it, but he was like, I look for real world validation because online they can move the goalposts whenever they want. Like 10 million followers, not enough. 30 million followers, not enough. Like, oh, you don't have 100 million followers? Like, oh, you're not successful then. It's like, that's not a measure of success. That guy, Black Zeus, is like light years ahead of everybody else, I feel like. Anything he posts, I'm like, man, this guy is so, so smart and so ahead of, like, he, he said... I think it was just a tweet or something along the lines of like, if you're ghosting people, you are a child because you're not doing And it. I was like, man, I feel like I will never, ever. Yeah. Right. Ghost anybody again, just because Zeus told me not to like, I, yeah. I it's totally. And, and it made me go like, what's the worst that happens if you're honest with somebody? Mm-hmm. Like if they get mad, you at least did the right thing. Yes. Yeah. They're not mad at you for skipping out on them completely. They're mad at the situation more totally. so than you. Like you, you always forget about like, like, you know, you'll have beef with somebody and then you'll be like, you know, I don't even remember what we were fighting over. Like that guy's a great guy or, or that girl's a great girl. And it was the thing in the moment, the heat of the moment that was like making you like all upset or whatever, not the person, even if they are doing the direct actions, it's how you're perceiving those actions and like totally. internalizing it. But yeah, 100%. if you go someone, then it's like you've, you, you're not being honest with them. You're not being honest with yourself. Like nope. I think he's in such a, and he said this during the podcast, but he's in that place where he can kind of like speak freely and it hits and it resonates because he's dealt with his trauma. Like he's like, I spent, you know, the ages of 22 to 27, just unpacking every bit of trauma I have. And now I feel like weightless, like I can do anything. And it, you hear it in his voice when he talks with such like, uh, what's the word like such certainty in his voice when he says something totally. such confidence in what he's saying where uh, some people get a little shaky on their opinions and then someone doesn't like it and they flip their opinion to make them like them again you know guilty <laughs> <laughs> same yeah. here man i don't like uh, when people are mad at me <laughs> yeah i hate well, that the, like i said the the other word that i wanted to do was authenticity and i feel like that's that's a big part of it too like i've i've been on this journey of you know, therapy and trying to figure out, again, the same things, dig through the traumas from when I was a kid and and even into my adulthood. And there's so much, there's so many things from, from when I was a kid where 
I was just trying to do what I thought other people would think is cool mm-hmm. or, or I was trying to emulate somebody else. And I'm now at a point where I'm me and I'm just trying to be me and fully, you know, be my authentic self. Because I think that that's a big problem with a lot of people is they are trying to be something that either somebody else wanted them to be or that they thought they should be. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to work on like, this is who I am right now. And this is, I just want to put forth. And I, even in, even my comedy writing, when I started, as I said, I was so obsessed with Carlin and Pryor and all these dirty comics, Doug Stanhope, that I was as in, like, I enjoyed as much the like, Ugh, kind of reaction than yeah. actual laughs yeah yeah and that's that's so fleeting i mean it's it's probably why howard stern now isn't like a shock jock the way he used to be yeah because eventually you go like this isn't real you're you're entertaining like a very small population and and writing for yourself and writing what's real to you specifically for me has felt so much better and i feel like more opportunities have come from me doubling down and writing about like, I, it's, it's funny because I feel like so many of my jokes are just straight up stories that have happened in my life. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm sure that's most people, but it, it's, if there's, I mean, other than the exaggeration of the joke, like taking whatever's silly and embellishing a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And even I've been working on one bit for a long time and I feel like there's no solid ending. So there's part of me that goes, maybe I just manufacture an ending. Um, It's, it's now at the point where I'm like, "Eh, they're the hardest. It's it's a long story joke. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have a joke exactly like that. And dude, I've tried, I've been trying to manufacture that ending for about two, maybe three, four years right now. I was going to say two years and I was like, but definitely been longer. It's like, probably four years and i just can't the story is incredible there's parts throughout it that are funny but i need that tight ending in order for it to be something you can do on stage is you want to close it off with a bang yes like it needs to have a button on it like it has to wrap up uh i if you come up with a way a technique or something let me know (laughs) because i think so i I did a part of it last night. I did a show last night and a comic before me was talking about how big of drinkers his parents are. And I was like, well, I guess I got to do at least part of that bit. And that that's how I started. I was like, let's do the story. Let me hear it. Can you just tell it? Not, not, you don't have to tell it like you're on stage, but you know, you can kind of walk through the full story. Yeah. Tell me the full story and then we'll see if we can come to craft, an ending craft yeah, this yeah. what's that that's what this podcast becomes bring me your bits <laughs> yeah that's um so like i said my parents were big drinkers when i was a kid they're actually now both sober my mom's like 14 ish years sober my dad wow. literally just celebrated 25 years sober yeah yeah man. shout out mark mcnally's parents hell yeah and so um this story was we went to this bar and uh with the specific type of beer I, in the joke, I call it filler tight. And I always go, the the slogan is it's filler time. Uh, every beer you bought, you got like a scratch ticket and you could win t-shirts, hats, lanyard. Uh, and then on the back of the ticket, you'd fill it out for an opportunity to win tickets for two adults to the Miami, Gr- Gr- uh, Miami Homestead Grand Prix, which my family didn't give a shit about. Yeah. But my parents that night drank 26 of those beers. So, of course, we were going to win because nobody else had that many tickets in. And so they won. And it was right around the time of uh, spring break or uh, March break, whatever you want to call it. And they're like, well, our kids love Florida. So they called the company and said, like, look, we want to bring our kids. We'll pay. But can you get them on the same flights and in the same hotel as us? And in the bit, I go like, this company must have been like, these kids are going to be good customers. So yeah, bring them along. And uh, we get there and they put us up in this hotel, which this used to be a part of the bit, but I've kind of pulled it out because it's just, 
it's too it's more information than it needs to be and while there's funny things to it so we're at this place called the hotel leslie it's right on miami beach it's like a hundred i think now it's like a 150 year old hotel no elevator the rooms are small and tight and cramped and because of People were smaller and brought less crap wow. with them. And, and but it it was in the bird cage. It was in uh Ace Ventura Pet Detective. It's been in all these movies. And um, like I said, right across from South Beach, Miami. And so every day we were going to the beach. We barely went to any of the events that like the company wanted us to go to. Because my parents just wanted a vacation. They didn't, yeah, again, yeah. they didn't care about the car racing. I think my dad went to like, my dad and I went to the pre-trials uh, because he was like, we have to use some of these tickets. Yeah, like, yeah. We have to what a waste that would be for somebody who actually totally. wanted to go. <laughs> and we all went to the the actual race itself. But I feel like my parents drove us there rather than take like the group bus so that once the three kids were like we're miserable get us out of here they could drive us back and that's that's what ended up happening but we would go across the street to the beach and the first couple days it was basically our beach and then by thursday we started noticing like the the beach is getting more and more packed oh no (laughs) and we're also noticing that mtv's pulled up (laughs) well that was it so so we're in an area and it's lots of men like majority men and the only women that are there are kind of on the outskirts and you know slowly by like friday saturday it's like all dudes in speedos and there's no holding back like clearly all these men are like in relations with each other is the nice way to put it (laughs) nice and so we go back the one day and the girl at the front desk goes I just want to like to my mom, like, I just want to let you know we're on South beach, but that's the gay beach in South beach, Miami. Uh, You're bringing your young kids there. And it's like, yeah, just a heads up. Beach. <laughs> so that was part of the bit. And they're very territorial. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like my. you could almost like. <laughs> it was, it was a sex education that I never thought I would get, man. Like it was it, like, that was their uh, beach. Dude. I feel like there's something like, uh, a bit towards the end of like you know like screw like drag time story hour like just take your kids to south beach like they'll learn everything you know what i mean like you could relate it to like something that's also kind of relevant like to the time too but like totally totally. just using the idea of that that it was a sex education that you didn't expect i think that's the kind of funny angle to it because i didn't think of think of that you know Totally. And that so the the original hook was the way and the way I still start the joke is my parents drank themselves lucky. And that's how they got the trip. And then when we do the thing of they they asked if we could come, they drank themselves bold. And then so the last tag, which I was hoping would be like the big end to it, I was like, somehow my parents just drank themselves woke. And it always like the other two tags would get like chuckles and laughs. That one would kind of just get like an eh. Like yeah. people, like I, I don't know if they weren't on board with it. And and I, I always I, felt like I had to explain, like, this is mid 90s. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't even think Ellen's episode of her coming out has has been on TV yet. Yeah. And my parents probably weren't the most, you know, gay friendly at the time. You know, they weren't that open minded at the time. Yeah. So but when you explain that, suddenly my parents are the bad guys in today's day and age. Yeah. So it's such a hard thing to like develop the bit. And I, I like I said, I, I've never been able to find like a proper close to it. Last night, I just literally dovetailed it into talking more about their drinking and that yeah. affecting me in a certain sense. But it just it just doesn't feel like it has like a hard close. So I don't know. There's I, I like the, with... the hook. So of like my parents drank themselves bl- blank. My parents drank themselves blank. Uh, the first totally. thing the first thing I thought of was that's just where my mind goes. But like my parents drank themselves gay, like just going straight for it. You know what I mean? Totally. Like sometimes the shock of just like saying a word like that where you're saying it in a funny way, like you're not you're not trying to be hurtful or at all. Right. Like totally. Um, but then from there, it was also like um you could even touch on before even mentioning that the beach was all gay dudes that like your parents are a little homophobic or whatever or you could even be 
but and then kind of say like they drank themselves into like giving you like a some type of sex education that they didn't want to give you some type of totally. they drank so much that like now you know how to give a blow job you know what i mean like something so like create and then your dad's like hey if we need any more beers just send mark down to the beach there you know what i mean like his totally. cute ass will pick up as many free beers <laughs> as we want like now they're using it to their advantage yeah. you know they buy me a speedo <laughs> yeah i just try to think of jokes like a curb your enthusiasm sketch it's like what would happen if like you were to reenact that moment in reality but through the mind of larry david you know like totally. how would larry write that story that's happened that, that's actually helped me so many times with a joke where i can't get the the wording of it or the timing of it I'll imagine another comic, like usually like a like say Bill Burr or whatever. I'm like, what yeah. would this I have the whole bit, but what would this sound like if Bill Burr did this bit? Cause we like you said, when we were kids, I did the same thing when I was a kid too, of repeating lines that you heard from Mad TV or Saturday Night Live or a comic Absolutely. special you watch. Now you can kind of tap back into that like uh silliness of acting like that comedian and like how yeah how would they deliver it if i wrote this bit for them how would they deliver it and it almost like helps you write in a sense because you're thinking like them as you're speaking like them and using their mannerisms or whatever 100 percent. yeah i've i've found uh you know the whole thing of like finding your voice is like a big thing that people talk about when you're first starting out and it wasn't until i saw uh, Tom Segura's first Netflix special that I was like oh that's sort of how I want to like I don't want to sound exactly like him but, but the yeah. way he tells stories the way he presents things and the, the silly way things come up in his jokes and I, I watched his new special Sledgehammer and that refreshed that in my mind of like man that's that's really how I, I've been trying to speak and and get these stories out and and I mean, again, there was times where I would see a new special of his and then all of a sudden my jokes start sounding exactly like Tom mm, Segura's. But, yeah, yeah. but again, I, I I think now this far into it, again, it's more the the tone and the, I don't want to say the cadence, but the, you know, just the, the way, like the delivery, I guess, is more what I'm looking for rather than being a carbon copy of Segura yeah. or Stan Hope or Bill Burr or even Carlin, you know. Yeah, those all those guys have a huge like kind of chokehold on um I I actually <laughs> there's some there was sometimes during my development where uh like first five years or whatever where I would be like doing a bit and I did the punchline and I was like, Oh, I kinda like in the moment I was like, Oh, I kinda said that like they would say it. Like you catch yourself. And that's just like, oh, man, you have to kind of like go back to the drawing board a little bit and be like, hey, how would I say this? Like, just be yourself. And that's honestly why I started this podcast was because it was like getting me more in tune with like what my voice sounds like, what my presentation style is like, like how I form, you know, improv sentences or whatever and come up with uh, questions and whatnot. But have you found like a point in your career where it clicked with you where you're like, that's my voice. Like I, I, you did a great set and you're like, this is, if I can keep doing this over and over again, then we got something here. Yeah. I think there was, there was sort of two moments. There was a still, when I was still in the, like wanting to be the raunchy dirty comic, I had a, I had like a week where I was doing mics every day. Like I just did a lot of sets and I did this like perfected five minutes where I got laughs all the way through. And that was the first time I was like, all right, I'm onto something here. I've not, I've never had, I've never felt like I've gotten continuous laughs throughout a whole set. And keep in mind, this is like two, two and a half years in where I'm now finally going like, okay, I'm, I'm able to make five minutes that are going to be continuously funny throughout. Mm-hmm. But for the, the voice part, I think when I started writing about working in film, And, you know, again, trying to write to me and be authentic to who I am. And because that's I mean, that's been a big struggle, too, is as much as as closely related as you might think comedy and film are. They don't really like it's it's hard to do one and do the other. 
Like mm-hmm. I've, I've been doing it for 11 years, but it feels like I've been doing it on and off for 11 years because if I'm full time on a show, I can't go off. I can't leave to go do open mics. Yes. Or yeah, yeah. Even, you know, I'd have to have a book show and talk to my boss beforehand and be like, Hey, can I get out early? Can I do this? Can I whatever? Mm-hmm. And so when I started talking about film and really dissecting it as like, I'm in this glamorous job, but I'm working with the same people you work with. You know, yeah, I do yeah, yeah. Thing about all the guys that I work with and not knowing any of their real names, only knowing nicknames. Yeah. And once I start rattling off the nicknames, even if you weren't into the premise beforehand, people start laughing because right away they go, yeah, I work with a shaker as well. Or I yeah, work with yeah. Tubby Tony or whatever. You know what I mean? Like there's like everybody works with people who you like. I, and I, when I started, I was going by a stage name. I was my like Instagram handle and everything like that. Duder McNarley. I was going on stage as Duder McNarley. No. <laughs> when I started out, I was Duder. And you were Duder? Uh, what made you change from Duder? Uh it was Kareem giving me shit about you you have a <laughs> you have a uh alliterative name, you have a name that people could remember. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I, I thought when I started as Duder that I would build a character mm-hmm. and that's what it would be. And again, so I had the jackass. Yeah. I had intent. And I think also that like the the jackass fan in me, you know, like Bam Margera, Johnny Knoxville, Steve O. I thought Duder McNarley was that kind of name. Yeah. And like I said, I think uh I think I realized I wasn't coming up with a character quick enough. And so I was like, there's nothing wrong with that name. It's still a nickname. It's still something like people call me that at work. There's still comics that call me that. But uh, while I was still going as a stage name, uh, somebody called me Mark. And I think it was Sabrina Shavanna's went, what did he just call you? And I was like, my name, Mark. She was, your name isn't Duder? And I was like, no, my parents did not name me Duder McNarley. <laughs> and that uh, so crazy. <laughs> it, yeah, totally. And so, so, like I said, I think I, I really, well, that was it too. The first time me, Aaron and Kareem went out, we all went on st- by stage names. Kareem, Kareem's Facebook name was Reem himself. So he got brought up as Reem himself. No way. Uh, I got brought up as Duder McNarley. And Aaron's name on Facebook was Rye Guy. And because everybody makes the list based on what your name is on Facebook, I still do that to people. I've I so brought... I changed my name on Facebook, dude, because I, w- I had my full legal name on there. And I was like, I need I want to go by my stage name, which is Johnny Rogers. Yeah. And so I was like, but every list I showed up to and I felt like such an asshole. I had to be like, uh, can you actually change that? Like, I know you got it off the face. I was like, let me just change it. To yeah. save everybody, <laughs> what, you, what you had to do, yeah. And I think I think that was the decision too. I decided to put my, I think I was weirded out by my family tagging me and stuff, and it being like Angela, Laura, and then Duder McNarley. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, it'd be one thing if this was totally like my identity, and and I had like a separate kind of like you know social media and all that kind of stuff. Like I don't know. Like I, The Rock is The Rock. I know he still yeah. goes by Dwayne Johnson, but there's like an element of he's always going to be the rock. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, it was just so funny that that like that that still makes me laugh. The fact that she was like, what? What did he just call you? <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, shit. Now, the one question that I, I'm sure you researched the podcast, so you know the question. But um, if you could make a phone call to 15 year old Mark, give him a piece of advice based on what you know now doesn't affect your current timeline what do you say to him trust your instincts trust trust your gut whatever you're thinking is the right decision is the right decision and and that's something i learned not too far off from being 15 years old but i i feel like i made so many decisions in that time based on what my friends wanted me to do what my parents were telling me to do yet when I started making choices that I thought felt right. And even like people, people, if you get a vibe of, I don't know how I feel about that person, trust it. 
Like mm. it's, it's more than likely that that feeling is right. So I would say trust trust your instincts as well as the authenticity thing. Just be yourself. I, I it sounds so cliche. It but needs it, to be said though. Yeah, it needs to be said. It's one of those things that it. I mean, I'm 38 and I still feel like I'm figuring that out. You look great, out. dude. <laughs> Thank you, man. It's nice. You as well. I don't know oh, how old you are, but 106. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're you don't look no. a day over 96. I'll, I'll be, be 32 that. in October, so nice, man. hopefully yeah. I keep the youth. Yeah. I think it's all these preservatives we eat these days. That's what's keeping us young, weirdly. Yeah, enough. yeah. Preserving our organs. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I just make sure to moisturize my face. That's one thing that dudes never do. They're like, I don't put face stuff on. That's gay. And I'm like, just, all right. You're going to be like Mr. Wrinkle Bag by the time you're 40, but that's fine. Yeah, you're going to look like a catcher's <laughs> bit. Yeah, dead ass. Days, so, good luck. <laughs> okay, I got I to gotta ask because there's all this WWE stuff in the background and AEW and everything. If you had one ticket, free ticket, to go to either an AEW event, a WWE event, or a TNA Impact event, front row, where are you going? Uh, WWE Royal Rumble. Okay. I've, I've done pretty well with going to shows in the last few years. Like I'm going to SmackDown in like a week. Nice. Uh, R- Ricardo Mejia and I are going to London for Wem for AEW and Wembley. We did all in in Chicago. Those are those are all like like it, all in was like life changing in oh, a weird life way. Changing. Interesting. No, I I just because I embraced something I had liked for so long, cause I'd, I'd given up on being a fan of wrestling in my teens and just, again, not Same. being authentic to myself going like, Oh, nobody else is into it. So I'm not yep. going to be into it anymore. When I started hanging out with Ricardo and Ernie Vicente, they were wearing bullet club shirts and made jokes about wrestling all the time. And so I kind of just went like, what, what are we talking about here? And then when that all in thing came, I was like, I want to be a part of that. And that whole weekend was such a, refresher of like me as a kid and enjoying it and that event was so fun that for like the next week and a half whenever i spoke to anyone they're like you you seem like you're doing great man yeah and i didn't want to say to them like i went to a wrestling show it was yeah, awesome. yeah. it's it really fucking was. awesome <laughs> yeah man but royal rumbles like a front row at royal rumble that would be the one for me for sure that's that's yeah that's I mean, a good bucket, pick that's as bucket list as it gets for me yeah yeah. I see. I still would love to see like a WrestleMania live. Never, do- never gone to that. Always watched them since I was a kid, like forever. The program from WrestleMania. Oh, wow. You're yeah. at 18. No way. Is that a good one, man? Yeah, yeah that's so. a, that's a good one to go to. <laughs> they totally. were, man, we were spoiled with wrestling Love. as kids. Those Love. were like classic, classic times. There's there's amazing matches that were on that show that I didn't remember I had seen. Like I saw Undertaker versus Ric Flair. Like I mean, come on, like Insane. that's 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 as big as it gets when I think about it. That was the Rocket versus Ho- like that match. I I can't take that out of like number one, number two area of like matches that I've seen live. Like I've seen some really good ones in the last few years um will osprey versus kenny omega is definitely one of the best ones i've seen and that was very recent uh cody rhodes versus nick aldis at all in was phenomenal but like the rock versus hogan the energy in that building was as crazy as it could i mean don't get me wrong i would have preferred better seats sure (laughs) because <laughs> I was basically watching it on the jungle. Oh, oh, yeah, that's like nice. where we were sitting. Yeah. But the energy in that room was as intense as you as I've ever felt before. And so, yeah, something like that for sure. Wow. Well, like I think, like I said, just the Royal Rumble is like so bucket list for me. It's my favorite event every year. And I'd love to be there for that. I got to ask favorite. you the same one. Yours, yours would be Mania. Yeah, it would have to be like just any any mania i'd be like more than happy to go to i don't even care what the card is because like i i phase in and out of wrestling too like i'll watch a little bit a and w a a and w jesus christ i guess that's what i'm having for dinner i watch a little bit of AEW. i watched uh i went to a tna impact live i also went to a bunch of like uh raw and smackdown house shows when i was a kid over in ogdensburg and cornwall i think was one of them too 
Um, never been to an AEW. I do a lot of like C4 wrestling, which is like an Ottawa local uh, independent thing. It's a the local stuff. Amazing. Fun, Dude, They're Stu Grayson wild. is there all the time. It was yep. a guy that I used to, he trained in the same class that was like part of the wrestling school that I went to. Um, so it's cool to like see the guys that I was like in a class with when I was 18. Now they're in these organizations totally. and like killing it. You're just like Uno also killing yeah. it, like absolutely killing it. I remember too, Wayne, the trainer uh, was like complaining that Uno was out of shape and he was like, if he stopped eating all those donuts. Like he could actually get into better shape. And I'm like, now he's like, that's his thing. You know what I mean? Like it does, totally. it has, it's inconsequential to his performance. Like he is that character and people love that fucking character. Right. <laughs> as I finished what I was saying, you were just like, frozen in a smile and, you, and i was like you said the frozen thing <laughs> you started freezing i could hear your voice but you were stopping oh it. no oh, did you hear me like oh. rifling through the promo <laughs> basically yeah well i had asked have you seen evil uno's face no no you always wear a mask <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. Eh, fuck. Oh, so you you just knew Grayson. You knew Stu. You didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I oh, okay. I saw him, but like, I I don't remember. Like, I couldn't if I couldn't pick him out of a lineup even. But I I feel like I definitely saw him without the mask on, just in training like a couple times. Yeah, that would every, make sense. Every other time I saw him, he was he had that mask on. Like he kept like pretty luchador like like oh it stays on the work is always happening like he's always that character i've been watching a ton of like lucha stuff where they talk about the lucha de puesta where it's like mask versus mask or hair versus mask that must be like, like so traumatic for me. like i think of Rey mysterio when he lost his mask that sucked like it was so anticlimactic climate because I don't know why I thought like, oh, I'm going to recognize him. And then he just takes yeah. it off and doesn't look like anybody I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm glad that he went back and wears the mask and is still the character. And He's like, you but, can still pull it off. Because there'll be new fans who have never seen that before. And, and they probably wouldn't even have any interest to go find it. You know what I mean? Like, I think everybody loved him so much as that character rather than, you know, what he became. Which wasn't a bad character yeah. by any means. But it really was like such an ending for no reason. Like you yeah. could shave it up Nash's head. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Uh, I'm happy to have you back because I'm gonna shout out all your socials so that people can check that stuff out. Amazing. I'm gonna just like cut the podcast back to this point. Um, go check out if you're in Toronto. Uh, Mark has a show at Comedy Bar. It's Tuesday, August twenty second at eight p.m. Um, is that Blur West? Right. So that's the new Blur location. West. No, the that's the original, original location. Original location okay. Yeah. Uh, so go check that out. Uh, tickets will be on the Comedy Bar website. Go follow him on Instagram at Duder McNarley. Um, at Duder McNarley on TikTok as well. At McNarley on YouTube. At Duder McNarley on X, formerly Twitter. And then, yeah, there's the uh, the Comedy Bar website to show you that you can go there and find out more about the show. Dude, thanks so awesome. much for coming on. I really, uh, really appreciate you your being flexible with schedule change and then uh, helping me make this happen. Appreciate it, man. Also, I just want to say quickly, uh, also on YouTube, uh, McNarley Media, and I have a McNarley Media um, Instagram page, which is all just film stuff mostly. Okay. Um, but that's trying to keep the branding as as consistently as possible throughout. But yeah, that's so yeah, important. man. I appreciate you having me on. Like I said, I love watching the clips. I love seeing what you're doing. Uh, this is an awesome show. I'm, I'm really happy I got to be on it. Thanks, man. That's very kind of you to say. And I appreciate you always uh, liking and showing support as well. So oh, go, yeah. sh- go show your support to Mark now. Everybody go focus and go follow his socials. <laughs> Pass oh, yeah. on the love. All right, man. I hope you have a great rest of your night. Thanks. You too, man. No appreciate more internet it. issues. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right. Later, everybody. You've been listening to The Johnny Rogers Show. New episodes air every Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 